Now, it might seem odd that human beings can calculate the degrees of genetic relatedness between themselves and, in fact, choose spouses and best friends on the basis of the more genetically inherited traits. But, in fact, very, very simple organisms can do it. This capacity and, in fact, desire to, to mate with somebody sim similar to oneself occurs all the way down the phylog phylogenetic scale. Insects prefer similarity, as many species of insects do. Birds do. Other mammals do. Even plants do. For evolution to work to create social assortment based on genetic similarity many, many times over in separate independent evolutionary events means that that trait confers fitness benefits. In other words, it helps replicate genes. It would never have evolved because it's costly. It would never have evolved if it wasn't adaptive. This particular study that I put up is a study of guard bees, uh, uh, of sweat bees. So the way sweat bees operate is you have a hive. There's a small opening to the hive. There is a guard bee that stands by the hive door. It's a big bee, and it blocks the hive entrance with its body. And it looks out. And when it sees another bee coming towards the hive, it makes a decision to move its body out of the way and let the bee in or not let the bee in. And it does this over and over and over again. In this particular experiment done by Greenberg in 1979 and published in Science, an absolute classic now in this field, he experimentally bred for degrees of relatedness to the guard bee. And he found that line that you see going up there like just a straight line is essentially evidence that the closer the degree of genetic relatedness there was to the guard bee, the more likely the guard bee was to let the other bee in. For our purposes, what you need to see is that even bees, complex though they may be, they're incredibly simple organisms by comparison with humans. In terms of the nervous system and the brain, it doesn't compare uh, with even ground squirrels or the size and complexity of our brain. And yet these bees have hardwired the capacity to discriminate degrees of genetic relatedness to itself and to prefer those who are similar, to act altruistically to those who are similar. We can go to the next slide. This is a ground squirrel. This particular ground squirrel is at the moment uh, barking an alarm call. It is standing up on its hind legs, somewhere in the Nevada desert perhaps, and uh, it spotted an eagle. An eagle will come down and prey upon this ground squirrel. It's putting itself in danger. What it should really do is die for cover. But the very fact that it's standing up on its hind legs and barking, warning all the other ground squirrels in the vicinity to take cover is an act of altruism. And the question for evolutionists, Charles Darwin posed the problem in 1870, and he said, how did evolution evolve? I mean, how did altruism evolve? It seems to go against the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution seems to be that you as an individual are selfish. Look out for yourself. If you survive, survival of the fittest, replicate your individual genes, this is the way natural selection works. The devil take the hindmost. So how does altruism, helping behavior, kindness to others, possibly evolve as an adaptation? And the simple answer, which wasn't really solved satisfactorily until about the 1960s, uh, is altruism, it is that altruism benefits genes. But you share genes. You share genes not only with your immediate family, but even with more extended family. And this ground squirrel is in fact far more likely to stand up on its hind legs, experimental evidence, when the squirrels around it, that surround it at any particular point in time, are genetic relatives. In fact, the more genetically related they are to this ground squirrel, the more likely it is to stand up. And if you go to the other extreme and put genetically unrelated individuals there, it will not stand up and give an altruistic signal. And this ground squirrel's capacity for discrimination, 
fine distinctions uh, is quite marked. In fact, ground squirrels are promiscuous, and the female will be impregnated by maybe two different males, and it will have a litter of perhaps eight little squirrels, four of whom are uh, full siblings and fathered by one male, four of whom are essentially half-siblings to the other four, fathered by a different male. Even the siblings are able to discriminate among themselves as to who is a full sibling that is sharing 50% of their genes, I mean 50% of their genes, and who is a half-sibling sharing only 25% of their genes. Agonistic interactions are much more among the half-siblings than among the full siblings. And there are a lot of experimental studies in the animal sociobiology literature that support this. Um, we can move to the next one. Of course, when, by the time you get up to chimpanzees, a very, very sociable animal, uh, the capacity for uh, discrimination, social discriminations, and so on, uh, become quite remarkable. And when you come to humans, as shown in the bottom slide, uh, with Jane Goodall there gazing almost lovingly at this chimpanzee and you will know from many of you that Jane Goodall is an animal rights activist and some people would say she prefers animals more than she does people we know that with humans the capacity for altruism really can take on uh, a level of ethical altruism that is universal and beyond even the human species so I'm not trying to suggest that this desire for your own relatives is in a, a totally animalistic, bee-like manner for humans. Uh, in fact, with humans and even chimpanzees, uh, social learning, a lot of social learning takes place. Um, and uh, obviously, as the case with Jane Goodall, extended altruism well beyond the kinship group is possible. But nonetheless, the basic impulses I'm arguing uh, stem out of uh, genetic similarity and altruism. We turn to the, la uh, the next slide. <laughs> These uh, are two chimpanzees looking extremely menacing. In fact, they are menacing, they're about to kill. Uh, Jane Goodall was absolutely shocked to find, after 20 or 30 years of research, that these chimpanzees engage in war. We know a lot more about chimpanzee politics in the last 10 to 15 years, and it's not a pretty sight. Uh, the young males go out like this in groups, and they hunt. They hunt other young males, and they hunt uh, members of adjoining tribes. They chase them up trees. They strategize how to bring them out of that tree, and then they beat them up for 10 minutes at a time until their necks are broken and they die. And in the process, they expand their own territory. They increase their own genes. And if they don't, then marauding males of the other neighboring tribes come in and do it to them. It's a kill or be kill uh, existence. It's an expand or contract existence. So it's altruism within the group and enmity outside of the group. Um, so. I've previously spoken about race differences. This is not a race difference that I'm talking about. This is part of human nature. All ethnic groups have genes, or all people have genes that predispose them, on average, to prefer their own kind. <coughs> because it is a mechanism by which genes replicate. If you help copies of your genes to replicate, your genes replicate. If, in fact, you hate copies of your own genes and go around killing them off wherever you see them, if nature produced such an aberration, your genes would disappear. It's very simple to do uh, a little mo uh, imaginary modeling in your mind as to imagine three different scenarios. Either there are genes for kin selection or ethnic identity, there are not, or in fact the opposite is true. There are genes for killing your own kind. Imagine five generations or ten generations from now, which kind of genes are in the world in a greater percentage. Clearly it will be the genes for altruism, for recognizing 
similar others, for discriminating against dissimilar others, and for preferring your own kind. Nepotism is the name we give to it. And it's not family nepotism, it's ethnic nepotism. And indeed, uh, apart from uh, historical moments, we're not surprised if when Sikhs come to the United States and set up a business, they uh, do business with other Sikhs. Or when other ethnic groups uh, come, Koreans, that they immediately gravitate and form social networks with other Koreans. This is true throughout history in all other parts of the world and it makes perfectly good sense. It doesn't just make good sense for the individual selfish point of view because he gets along better with them and can trust them better. It makes broader evolutionary sense. By acting in this way, he will more likely increase copies of his own genes in the future. The final thought, before we can open it up for questions, is that all I'm really trying to say is that this is not a genetic imperative within us. Uh, another sociobiologist has used the word whisperings from within, and maybe that's too soft, but it's somewhere between a whisper, a genetic whisper, and a genetic imperative, but it is not genetically neutral. This is a tendency within humans to recognize uh, genetic similarity and to prefer it, and it forms the basis, I think, of ethnic identity. Thanks very much.